Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Dave Clark. I am past this director for District 100. Well, I speak here with Mr. Spavanoff for District 100. Welcome to the City Wayne and Higher Super Zero. It's you and the fifth. 23 bar. Well, I know that when Tom and Tony are here, they always have something to give away, but since we're not here, there's no giveaway for any prize tonight. <laughs> I do have one prize I want to give away. So anybody who wants to get the question, get five dollars. Later, get five dollars. And the question is, if you're on line and yelling out to the golden five dollars, what are the ones salad that was not served on the Titanic? There's one salad. Anchor. Right. One. Salad. Well, what we're iceberg. Oh, <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Okay, have gas ready to get home. <laughs> this is more well, volume. I can't get it any higher than that. Mm -hmm. Now, my opportunity to help I just try to for our first speaker. I could get it. Working for his qualified team. He will be introduced by his mentor. And the lady that we've known for years, the only thing to introduce you to is Ash. Yes. Yep. Ash. We forgot my own title. Yeah, I forgot my own title. District, district Director, District 12, and he's also qualified speaker in District 100 and District 12. Retired principal, the lady that travels the world, making me jealous. <laughs> but then again, I tell her not to go to certain parts of the world, which can be a little dangerous, and she proved that to us when she raced back home after a while. So hopefully, when things settle down, she'll get a chance to travel some more. Please welcome Charlotte Nago, our mentor for our first speaker. Distinguished Toastmaster Ralph Dieter has been a member and an officer of Toastmaster for 14 years. He and his wife. Laura Sicking have been active in building, mentoring, and assisting clubs, both in District 12 and District 100. He's a former U.S. Army retired veteran and a retired professor of economics. Tonight, he is bringing his positive immigrant story to this audience and hopeful to others. He believes it is important to share his story, to continue what his father started in, in, in encountering the Holocaust denial trend that is becoming popular in the United States. Please help me welcome tonight distinguished Toastmaster Ralph Dieter in his presentation entitled Tomorrow will be a better day. <laughs> Good luck. Thank you, Dr. Char. Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, welcome guests. Tomorrow will be a better day. Without hope, you're lost or even dead. This story of my family is an answer to Holocaust deniers and one family's immigration story. It is also an attempt to avoid getting submerged in the melting pot. My story begins with my father, Olaf's, immigration into to Frankfurt, Germany, he was born in, in Czechoslovakia, but migrated with his mother to Frankfurt when he was three. It was never easy for him growing up because Germans at that time didn't trust people who were born elsewhere but he skillfully adapted to his environment. 
until one day his bitter stepfather turned him into the Gestapo for being half Jewish. Feeling betrayed and desperate, he went, he, he got a, a letter from the Gestapo telling him to show up at a Let's see, where was I? He uh, he attempted to to deal with this letter. The letter said that he had to appear at a train station for deportation. So he went to this concentration camp for forced labor with his head held high. He, just like he did in Frankfurt, he adapted to his new environment, as difficult as it was, skillfully. In this camp, though, the work, the work that they did really wore them down until they couldn't work anymore because of injury or sickness. And then death usually followed. So how did my father and others survive? Because one in three died in this camp. One in three. Well, most survivors had strong mental toughness. For my father, it was an attitude of tomorrow will be a better day. Tomorrow finally came with liberation by units of Patton's Third Army. The U.S. Army saved my father's life. Otherwise, I wouldn't be giving this speech. My mother, Ilsa, had her own story. She was born in a poor farm region. Her family lived in a rundown old mill in the middle of the farm. She developed great strength working on, on that farm. And she when she went to school, she had an intelligence that she didn't know she had. Her strength that she developed allowed her to do many jobs that were very difficult physically, and that even included being a high wire performer when she couldn't find any other job. After, after the war. So my father developed a plan to start a new business, trucking business. He got reparations from the German government because he, he was a concentration camp survivor. He carried the uh, the troop that my mother eventually joined when she couldn't find work out in the country, she joined uh, the high wire troop, and he carried their equipment. They stretched wires often between church steeples high above the ground. And in 1949, while they were at a location called Garmish, a beautiful resort location, my mother met my father and they fell in love. But 
the troop had a very hard thing that happened to them. They had a member of the troop that drove a motorcycle on the high wire and he fell off the wire to his death. My mother and father decided that they would quit the troop. I came along in 1950 and the family needed to have a, a, a stable place to live. But you know, in those days, after World War II, both my parents and had constant hunger while the World War wound down to its conclusion. Trying to find an apartment and food sources were nearly impossible. But with my father's attitude of tomorrow will be a better day, they were able to find an apartment. It wasn't much. One room and a bathroom that they had to share with other families. My parents wanted to have a better life. So they started considering uh, moving or uh, emigrating to the US from Germany. Also, there was another problem. My father heard whispers in the Germans around him, der da, der ist Jude. That guy's a Jew. He, he was tired of hearing statements like that. And that even made him more strongly inclined to leave Germany. His trucking business began to fail and he, and he got a mechanics job with the US military. He got hiring preference because he was a concentration camp inmate. So this family, if they left Germany, it would be, they'd be having sacrifices because the reparations from the German government would no longer be there and he'd have to give up that mechanics job with the Americans. But they were still strongly convicted to leave the country. So as Julius Caesar said, the die is cast. They gave up their precious apartment and moved into an internment camp for refugees. My father had uh, used the fact that he was in a concentration camp to be declared a refugee, which helped his immigration status and ours too. So we went into this internment camp. It was actually a prison camp because you could go in, but they had to decide whether they'd let you out or not. We had intensive physical exams because the US government didn't want to have disease-ridden refugees en enter into the US. That wasn't all. U.S. Army intelligence officers interrogated my parents to see if they were communists or Nazis. When they were convinced that we were healthy, regular people, they released us from the camp. And we went to uh, another camp in Bremerhaven, a port on the North Sea. Thank God we survived. Dad's mantra pulled us through again. And then the day came when we were about to board an old Liberty ship for the two to three week journey between Bremerhaven and New Orleans, where we would disembark. My grandmother was on the dock and she cried so hard that her body shook visibly. Both she and my mother knew that they probably would never see each other again. So it was a hard and sad time for them. But then we approached New Orleans. 
the skipper decided not to dock right away because he wanted to to come into port on June 14th, 1951, Flag Day. So eagerly and excitedly, we came down the gangplank to first set foot in the land of unlimited opportunities. But then my parents were in for a big shot. My father went into a restroom and everybody in the restroom was just staring at him as if to say, what are you doing in here? His immediate reaction was, oh no, not here, not in the US. My mother and I were sitting on a park bench outside the restroom and we got the same look from a woman sitting at the end of the bench. What was going on? We surveyed the area and then, then it occurred to us. The restroom was designated only for black people. That really shook my father up because he had seen the same thing happening to Jews uh, during the Nazi times. The The causation, I, I really didn't understand the causation until recently. Turns out that German lawyers had observed Jim Crow laws at work during the 30s. So the Nazi system of segregating Jews from non-Jews was influenced by the Jim Crow South. We decided we didn't want to uh, sightsee and wanted rather to proceed to our place of permanent residence. So we hopped on a train and traveled to Petaluma, California, which is north of San Francisco, to begin our life in the land of unlimited opportunities. We were grateful to the Lutheran World Relief Organization for coordinating an introduction with a Lutheran church that had sponsored us coming here. The first few days, we had to stay behind the curtain of a multipurpose room of the church until a parishioner gave my dad his first job in a lumber yard and also gave us our first apartment. Then we really began to see the differences in living standards between the US and the old country. We got a single family house. It had two bedrooms, one for me and one for my parents. It had a bathroom that only my family used. What a difference between our house and that apartment in Frankfurt. We were the only occupants that used it. So there couldn't be any complaints about an occupied bathroom anymore. And my parents, began to take advantage of the unlimited opportunities. They entered a local community college. They overcame their language challenges and got degrees. My mother continued to San Francisco State and became a fifth grade teacher. Later, she got two master's degrees, one in special reading problems and one in marriage and family therapy. She had a 16 year counseling practice. Not bad for a poor farm girl who had only made it to the eighth grade in the old country. 
My father got a job as a psychiatric technician in an institution for the developmentally disabled. Parenthetically, developmentally disabled people were also sent to concentration camps in the Nazi times. He had great pleasure and high respect from his colleagues taking care of developmentally disabled people. Until he retired. He was highly incensed by the tendencies toward Holocaust denier, denial. And so he lectured to organizations who were dedicated to Holocaust remembrance, to educational institutions, and religious institutions of all faiths until almost the day that he died in 2014. But still, he remembered the pain and fear from the camps. He even cried two weeks before he died. But even to the end, he always had an attitude of tomorrow will be a better day. My mother retired from her practice and became active in her church, especially in her choir, which toured Europe and performed in Germany and even in St. Petersburg, Russia. My parents' experiences really taught her three kids a lot about life and how to be quietly tough as she was. Their wisdom I mean, my parents gave me a safe haven to be who I became. Their wisdom helped me to be successful. My educational path was quite successful. I graduated in the top 10 of my high school class of 500. But at the beginning, before kindergarten, they told my parents that I shouldn't speak German at home. Otherwise, I'd have difficulties. That didn't prove to be correct. I performed my service in the US Army in various places all over the world at various times. And after I got out, I continued my education and got a PhD in economics. I worked in civilian jobs as a corporate manager for various corporations, including United Airlines and Intel Corporation. And my last job was as a professor of economics. I will always remember my parents. I too, when I retired, became active in my church as a church council member as a assisting minister, as a cantor, and I will continue to learn from 
my life as my parents encouraged me to do. And I have seen the life-changing experiences of Toastmasters. And I know in my heart that tomorrow will be a better day. Mr. Toastmaster. Yeah, you need that. <laughs> I was a pickpocket in my earlier days. Well, congratulations, I was really impressed with that. At this time, we'd like to do is for all those of our QSs are working on, on your ballots to vote, we normally like to have some comments from our QSs on how you felt this presentation went. And I'd like to start hopefully with our mentor if she has any comments that she'd like to share with the audience on how Ralph did today. Any Thank suggestions? I, I don't need that. I don't yeah. think. Thank the you. Online, people, online people need to hear you. Oh, online people <laughs> want to hear me. Online people want to. Hi, people. Glad you're here. Ralph, I am thrilled to have had the opportunity to mentor you through this process. It has taken us a while to get there. But I believe that your heart and your mind and your soul was involved in this speech. I was glad to see that you were able to move forward without notes. That has been a big accomplishment. I am really proud of you for that. I think that one of the things that's going to happen when you go out, if you are accepted as a QS, is to continue to work on the technical aspect because you're not going to have Lois there with you when you preach that. Well, maybe you will, but. <laughs> Part of the <laughs> Can't get away from her. <laughs> the other suggestion I would make is that when you think you tend to pace and look at the floor, you need to remember that there are people that you need to continue to have eye contact with. But again, I'm proud of you. I think you have grown beyond means of where you thought you could be. And thank you for the courage to try. Thank you, Charlotte. Do we have any of our online QSs who would like to make a comment or suggestions? Let's go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah. Um, I'm have I think, Let's see, I who think we got here? Her hand up. You gotta stop sharing? Did you stop sharing? Oh, yes, I did. Okay. Let's. Well, Ross, you have your hand up, looks like. Did you say Roz or someone else? Yeah, yeah, I see. I see. <clears throat> okay, we have, I see your hand up and I see Randy's hand. I think Randy's was up first. Randy, why don't you go ahead? Oh, okay. All right. Uh, Ralph, good seeing you, buddy. Uh, thought I would beat her tonight, but I'm obviously not. I want to, uh, say to you that the story that you shared with us is powerful it's powerful from a lot of different perspectives um one of the things that you you brought us into was really talking about parents and and how your parents survived and thrived through all of that that they went through and i think each and every one of us can relate to to that in terms of our parents. Again, powerful story. But when you are considering going out and sharing this with others in whatever environment you are, you got to make sure that you don't overuse the word I and include other words to bring the audience in and make that emotional connection. And that emotional connection in your story can be as powerful as as I, I don't even understand I don't even know the words to bring up right now because of what your family and what you went through. All I can do is relate 
to it from the standpoint of one one moment you talked about understanding the Jim Crow era because you were experiencing some things that occurred because of that. But there's a connection that needs to be made with the entire audience. And there are a lot of people here that may or may not in your audience understand the Jim Crow aspect of it, or they may have blocked it out and it may mean nothing to them. So I would say find some ways to really include and share more on the emotional side so that you bring the audience on this roller coaster with you because it's a powerful story. And at the end of the story, there's light at the end of the tunnel. There's this success that you've become, that your parents have become, and your outlook on life gives the audience something to look forward to no matter what's going on and what challenges they face. And there are very few of us that are going to chase or experience what you experienced. And so make it real for people so that you give them a strong takeaway, because this is a, a powerful story if you if you take it to that point. And I just want to share that with you. And thank you for reminding us that tomorrow is a brighter day. Thank you, Randy. Roz, do you have something you want to share? Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. Dr. Ralph Dieter, this is the first time I've heard you acknowledge that you have a PhD and I've known you for several years. So thank you, Dr. Ralph Dieter for this presentation. It was very emotional for me to take in all that you shared about your family, what your parents experienced, and what you experienced as a little child. Maybe you didn't realize the full effect of moving from Germany to New Orleans to Northern California. And all of that painted a picture for me of retracing the steps of your livelihood. And when you started saying that there's tomorrow's a better day, your father said exactly the right words to you and you carry it with you to now. Make sure that the audience understands like Randy said, what Jim Crow means, because not everybody does. You know that there are discriminatory things that happen to people who move from one country to another. The United Next States model. is not perfect, but it seems to be a place where a lot of people want to move to and start a new life. And you managed, your family managed to do that. Thank you for sharing your journey from step to step. I was able to follow you and picture you going from one place to another and how you adapted. Maybe a little bit more about what you recognized, what you were afraid of, what took you from one place to the next and how it impacted. I heard what you said, how it impacted your parents, but I didn't necessarily hear how it impacted you as a young child to an adult. Take it for granted that you have an immense knowledge. You have come a long way. And I personally want to thank you for being right here, right now in this room to share that story with us. Thank you. Thank you, Roz. Any of our in-person QS would like to make any comments or share some of my thoughts? Go ahead. Microphone? Yeah. Stick the microphone. Yeah. All right, thank you for your story, Ralph. Um, I thought it was really interesting, I did. And I'm going to uh, just limit my comments to two areas. Uh, one good. is oh. a story. You're telling a story. And so I really want to see it. And your pictures 
helped me to do that. The pictures of the high wire, the pictures of the school, the pictures of you, that, that was really good. And I would say, use your words to help me see it also. So when you, when you say there's a concentration camp, I only have a vague idea of what that looks like. But if you talk about everything made out of steel, the temperature, you know, dipping below 45 degrees or whatever, now you're drawing me in by helping me to, to see and to feel that. So that would be one area that I would say. And the other one is I really liked your use of the repetition of the title. And so it functioned almost as a foundational phrase, if you will, a phrase that pays. And I would do it even more. But let me make this recommendation. Use it at the end of each section. It's going to be, you know, your parents or whoever is telling you, and they said, it's going to be a better day. And then the first line of the next one, and it was, and then you go into, you know, getting the two bedroom house or whatever. Um, and I think that will help the structure. So those are my recommendations. All right. Thank you very much. Well done. <laughs> so I understand. Any other QS would like to share? Yes. Hi, Ralph. I thought your story was excellent. I, I particularly liked all the details. I kind of like to talk about the details because the details made the story, but it also almost overwhelmed the story. So my recommendation to you is to maybe organize some of those details around, okay, you had one theme, tomorrow's a better day, but maybe uh, my father in uh, Czechoslovakia, then my father in, in, and, and just have some themes that, what did you learn? Were there any sub themes to tomorrow will be a better day? Uh, like when you went into the bathroom and this bathroom is just for your family. And that I was kind of like, okay, we got over to America and we saw something different that we would even seen over in Germany. So I, I, my recommendation is to make sure your themes come out a little more powerfully and you've got all kinds of details to support various themes in there. And I think it's, it's a great story. It, it will be a good speech one day. I just think it could be organized just a little bit better to emphasize those themes, what you learn, get the emotion in. And uh, I did notice the the telephone, somebody had to mention it, the telephone really kind of threw you off, started a little, a little slow, a little nervous at first, but you got a lot better as you went along. And if you could organize it around certain themes, what is it, what's our takeaway? What do you want us to take away and if there's three, four, five things that you want us to take away, that would be perfect to organize it around those themes. Thank you much. Anyone else? Okay. I'll mention, I really, Ralph, I really did enjoy this presentation. It showed a lot of emotion and it showed a lot of insight as well. Pretty much a lot of people, this is the younger generation, don't even begin to understand. And I think that's an important message you can bring on because as the country you mentioned with our younger generation, they don't really understand what had gone on. I had had the fortune of working with a lot of individuals who were in World War II as soldiers when I went into manufacturing. They told me a lot of stories about what happened over there. So I got the opportunity to learning firsthand what they had to share. And your presentation did an excellent job. I felt one of the things like Charlotte mentioned that you have a tendency to look down at the ground. And that's not bad if you just look down at the ground to gather your thoughts, but don't be speaking at the same time look up against the audience and address them again. You did the same time when you kind of go sideways and you look down, then you start speaking again. And whenever you're going to start speaking, face your audience. That way they can see eye contact with you and see the sincerity in your eyes and your voice. And when you speak, I've always thought a speech like this has to have a strong conclusion. I think you could have maybe had a bigger one. I thought to myself, what would I have said? Especially when you talk about tomorrow will be a better day. I think maybe perhaps we could have recapped the whole thing at the end from high wire act, Mechanic, education, different degrees. Now, I qualify your engineer and stuff that you did. Bring those three steps together, saying that now it definitely was a better day. So if you could recap the whole presentation from the beginning to the end, how things progressed in those regards, their accomplishments. When here, I went, they went from here to here to here. And when he mentioned the bathroom, I said, I can imagine you're just a young boy saying, well, this is a better day as <laughs> you walk into a bathroom that's not a community bathroom. Okay, but with that, I thought you should go next to the speech, especially those kinds of speeches. 
Tom, what do you got to say? What say you? We'll start with start with Connie. Ralph, I enjoyed your speech very much. I think you're, as stated by some others, I'll be doing a little repeating, I think. A powerful story, very informative, very interesting. I think if you work on the delivery itself, it was mentioned there was some pacing, some times when you were looking down instead of at the audience, and maybe some more vocal variety throughout. I noticed in the second half, especially when you talked about coming over and you had your own little house and that you really picked up, you uh, felt a, a lot of more showing and, and through your presence, what you were feeling and all. And what else did I have here? Oh, perhaps a little, times when there'd be a little, Clear, need for a little bit of clarification. Like I'd like to know maybe your age at ver when these various things were happening to you. But yeah, I think just working on a little bit, probably the delivery and trying to pick that up a bit. Uh, but the story itself is one that should definitely be heard. Tom? Uh, yes. Uh, Ralph, I heard this before and when I heard it, I knew this was a story that needed to get out into the world and be told. I evaluate speakers and vote on speakers based on maybe not looking for perfection. You've had a number of suggestions about looking down and the, maybe some extended pauses and so on. But I don't look for perfection in terms of the presentation, the mechanics of the style. But is this a story that needs to be told? Are you the one that can tell the story? And uh, not really supposed to say this, but you've got my vote based on this is a story that needs to get out into the world and be told. And so I'm really enthusiastic, but like I said, there's numbers of things and you've heard many of those things and though I won't reiterate those things, but, but I want you to feel confident. One, of the, one thought I had was that maybe you were trying to do it too much word for word. I love the passion and the emotion in your face. And I love the change of emotion. You talked about the upbeat nature of a house with your own bedroom and that sort of thing. And it's a little bit of humor there was good too. So, so just continue to develop this speech when, as soon as you get a chance to get out and, and give it to the world, give it to the world, practice it at other Toastmaster clubs. There are still, if you have talked about it, there are still Holocaust deniers and there are still people who don't realize the, the tragedy of the Jim Crow era. So both of those lessons that you had for us as an audience are ones that need to be told. And I believe you're the one to tell it. With that, back to you. Right, thank you, Tom. Seeing no more hands, and we can now go ahead and move right into our next speaker. Roz, you'll be our second speaker, okay? Thumbs up. Okay. <laughs> Roz okay. Carter. Roz Carter was born in New Orleans woo, and moved to Los Angeles in 1964. She is a widow of, with three children and two grandchildren and currently lives in Moreno Valley. She retired from the city of Moreno Valley in 2009. Roz has been a member of Toastmasters since 2005. She was also a member of Toastmistress before women could join Toastmasters. Shameful. Today, she will tell us about, the, about both organizations and her life story about adoption and reunion. Her speech title is, I Found Her, I Found Her. Please welcome Roz Carter. Roz, do you have the floor? Thank you so much, David. Wow, look at the faces of the audience. Have you heard that everyone has a signature story? Raise your hand. Everyone has a story, and only they could tell it. Like Dr. Ralph Dieter told an amazing, awesome story tonight that only he could tell. Have you ever lost something and it was lost, you couldn't find it? Maybe it was a ring. Maybe it was a book. 
Maybe it was your car in the parking lot at a shopping center. And now you're at a loss of what am I going to do? I cannot find it. But have any of you lost a child? Raise your hand if you can relate to that. Losing a child at a young age. When you're listening to other people telling you what to do. My signature story is about becoming pregnant when I was 16. And I had to listen to what everyone else said, especially my parents, that I could not raise this child. So I was sent away to a home for unwed mothers. I went to a Catholic school and the principal recommended St. Anne's as the place that I should go. They keep it a secret. The parents don't have to worry about their child having to deliver a baby without any kind of support. Well, what kind of support is that? You have a place to live, a place to learn because it's still a school. You must finish school while you're away in a home. And then you have your baby and it's immediately taken away from you. Don't look at your baby. Don't hold your baby because you might get attached. Little did I know that there was such a thing called separation trauma. The baby inside of a mother's womb knows the heartbeat. They even know the sound of their mother's voice. And then when they're born and they're taken away and placed with a family that wants to adopt a child and give them a loving home, they're looking around like nothing is familiar. The voices are strange. The heartbeat, it doesn't feel the same. But because they're an infant, they have no choice. They are adopted. And adoption is a marvelous thing. Do you know anyone who's been adopted? Have you been adopted? You may have a child that you adopted, but did you know that there might be a little bit of separation trauma in their early age, infancy, where they're looking for their birth mother? They're looking for something familiar and not feel so out of place. Where am I? What is this child thinking? Nobody asks the child how they feel. As adults, we assume the role that we're going to take care of this child, adopt them, and raise them as if they're my own child. And maybe they won't even tell them that they were adopted. Let me just straighten it out right now. The earlier you tell a child that you have adopted, that they are adopted, the better off they'll be. The mental health of those children will be enlightened and appreciative of the family that's raising them. And they will love them forever because they know that this couple took them in and made sure, wow, they loved me so much that they took me in as their child. 
and then remind them of the birth mother and father who had to relinquish them for circumstances beyond their control and know that they love them too. They love them so much that they were willing to give them to another family to be raised better than perhaps they could have. Now, I was 16. Oh, my goodness. I had to go on with life, finish high school, move away, get married, have more children, and then a letter arrived when my daughter was 36 years old. She had a lady who was an, on a search for me on her behalf say, I found her. And my daughter was embraced by her adoptive family and said, congratulations, now let's go find her. But the first thing she did was write a letter. Can I read that letter to you? It will tell you a story about what my daughter was thinking all this time. And I'm going to turn on a different background so you could see her. Dear Mrs. Carter, I can't believe this is happening, that I took a leap of faith and decided to finally search for you. Oh, I've wanted to do this for so many times, but would stop because of fear. And although I'm still scared of the outcome, I must continue and ask if you are willing to open the door and allow me to step into your life. Yes, my name is Taya, or rather my birth name is Dina, and that's the name I gave her to keep track in her mind, in my mind, of the reality of this person that was lost. I'm your daughter and I just turned 36 years old and made the decision to search for you and this time complete it. I hope that you have thought about me and have wondered about me and are willing to share some information with me. I have questions, but let me say I am not angry with you. I, that feeling is long past and I am at peace with that. That tells me, ladies and gentlemen, she had some anger. Can you, will you allow me to know you? If you are willing, I look forward to hearing from you by letter, email, or phone. And she provided that information. She continued saying, I want to say so much more, but I'm reluctant to, because I first must know that you want to know me. Anyway, thank you for giving me life and sharing me with another family. That was a brave decision. And I am thankful. Right now, I desire to fill the void within that I have dealt with for so many years and replace it with answers and hope. Sincerely, Taya. And there she is. What do we do when we have lost something, or in this case, lost someone, and then they find you? after a diligent search. And right now there's Facebook and, you know, the Ancestry DNA and all these other resources where you could track someone down, but without a name, without a place of birth, without an age, it's rather difficult to get started. Now I have the honor of doing a podcast with my daughter, Taya, and it's called, I Found Her. 
she found me and I found her. And we have a beautiful future together. If you ever want to hear the poignant stories that go way back to birth, adoption, and our reunion, I want you to listen to our podcast called I Found Her. Take a moment and think about what it's like to be adopted, to adopt someone, the relinquishment of that individual, what their life has been like since they were born without you being in the picture and then reuniting. Oh, what a wonderful feeling it is. What an exciting time for us because we are in each other's lives. And from the moment that we visited in LA, the home for unwed mothers and walked through the halls and things started to look a little familiar. I saw the long hallway and the big double doors that I remember being rolled into when I was in labor and gave her up. And that was the last time I saw that place. It was in their hands to make sure she was adopted into a wonderful family. And she was. I met her adoptive parents. Take a journey with me through I Found Her and learn what it's like to be reunited and take advantage of the love that adoptive and birth parents have with their child. You'll never forget it. Back to you. Back to you, David. And while we get our second speaker ready to go i'll have a little story it seems there was a couple middle-aged couple married sitting on the porch one day and the wife says to her husband honey if i pass away before you do would you consider remarrying the husband looks at her and says well you know i've been happily married with you i really enjoyed the married life if i meet the right person perhaps i would get married again the wife looks at him and goes, oh okay and we won't seem pleased about it but i'll accept it and she said, well, if you remarry, would you have your new wife move into our house? And husband says, well, I mean, the house is almost paid for. There's no reason to have to sell the house. I mean, sure, I'd probably bring my, my new wife into this house. Well, the wife didn't really like that comment either. She says to him, well, then I guess soon you would keep our same furniture in our bedroom and everything. He goes, well, honey, I don't see any reason of getting rid of all our furniture just because I have a new wife. I mean, it's all paid for. It's still in good condition. I would probably just keep the same furniture in the house and have my new wife come with me. And her wife you know, looks at him and says, you disgust me and says, well, I bet you probably use my golf clubs too, wouldn't you? And the husband looks at her and replies, well, no, actually, she's left-handed. As a, as a single man, I'm allowed to make those kind of comments because if nobody's going to, no, 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 because if anybody turns me in, I have nobody to face at home and that, you know, take it out on me. Not as yet. We're going to do that while we're waiting.
こともあるじゃん。See a foreign. He did say he's single, right? Yeah. See a foreign. Hawthorne. See a foreign. Hawthorne. Hawthorne. Okay. His glasses are. Is an as an author of ten gripping novels. She is a poetess of renown, of renown, having a, authored more than hundred lyrical gems. You're making me do words I'm not even used to. <laughs> Those masters, they taught me. Public education. <laughs> in addition to her writing acumen, she is a gifted speaker, qualified speaker, motivational speaker. Entertaining speaker, inspirational speaker, and a vision board presenter. CF is a graduate of alumni of the Eleanor Jean Greer Leadership Academy, lifetime of NAACP, and she is 20 years to life in the state institution. Call. Call. Okay. Oh, they call you. State institution call. Saturday mornings, Toastmasters at 797. Oh, it's all one. <laughs> okay. I'm saying that's state institution talk. <laughs> <laughs> CF's quote, it ain't easy being me, but somebody's got to do it. It ain't easy me, but somebody's got to do it. CF Pothole. <laughs> oh. What he was supposed to say is that I'm a 20 year, 20 years to life member in the state institution called Saturday Morning Toastmasters Club 797. I've already did 20 years, but I think I'm going to go head on and do life. Raise your hands if you want, if you desire peace, love, and happiness in your life. Yeah. Now, why don't you clap those hands if you just happen to want, like, good health, prosperity, and happiness. Come on, let me hear you say that. Now, I need you to also say more money, more money, more money if you want some money in your bank account. Let me hear you say more money, more money if you want some money in your bank account. That's what I'm saying. You know you want some money. I threw it all to you because I heard you and I felt you. <laughs> she wants love. There is power in vision boards. There really power. At first I was going to say there's magic, but when I went out to say there's magic in a vision board, a lot of people want abracadabra and it's here. Now, when I say that there is power, in a vision board. How do I know? Well, welcome to my vision. Toastmasters, fellow Toastmasters, most honored and welcome guests, and especially to the people in this room that wants it all. Welcome to my vision. See, like Martin Luther King, I too had a dream. I had a dream that one day I would be telling my truth in front of a crowd of listening ears. And then I would go on to a TED talk. Oh, and then maybe host my very own talk show. Hmm. C.F. Hawthorne, talk a lot, talk show. That would be my talk show. Now, when I say that there is power in the vision boards, is because I, I never was a believer in the power of a vision board. Matter of fact, I wasn't a believer in vision boards at all. I didn't believe them. They've been around for years and centuries. However, raise your hand if you heard of a man called Carl Benz. Carl Benz, no? Well, guess what? In the 1800, Carl Benz had a vision board. Well, it was more like a blueprint 
But right now, well, this, this afternoon, out in the parking lot, I counted 15 Mercedes Benz, Carl Benz, made a vision board. And there was power in it. Now, for me, myself, as I stated, I have nine vision boards. And I really wasn't a believer until I made one. And after I made that one vision board, and it actually came to fruition, ladies and gentlemen, I was hooked. I had to step back and say, oh my gosh, this really works. For an example, as you can see over here, this picture here, I was almost 400 pounds getting ready to have that cut your stomach surgery. I made a vision board to lose weight. The vision board included this picture here, but also around the picture, it was everything that thinner people would do. They didn't have the arthritis. They could run up the stairs and not pass out. They could actually walk across the room and get water instead of, for me, it was two Cokes and a candy bar. That was dinner. But I made the vision board and I lost the weight. Now, after I lost the weight, I realized that, hmm, I look good. <laughs> yeah, I know I do. Thank you very much. But I wanted a better car. I had a mama wagon, a Ford Explorer. I wanted a convertible. I wanted a convertible. So what did I do? I made me a vision board. I didn't bring it, but I made me a vision board of a convertible and I put it in the ceiling of my bedroom. So every day when I would wake up and every night when I would go to sleep, I would have that vision board. Well, y'all just call me Mustang Sally, baby. I own a red Mustang convertible. Miss Thanks saw me in. Was I not looking good? That's what I'm saying. That's it with a vision board. Now, after I lost the weight, after I was riding in that Mustang convertible, guess what, guys? I no longer wanted to work. I didn't want to go to work. I live in California with a Mustang and a cool body. There's no need me to lock it up from nine to five. So I made me a vision board to retire early. I retired at 53. I've been retired for seven years. I'll be 60 this year. I never look back. So when I'm saying that there is power, it's not magic because what you have to do with this vision board, you must put it where you can see it at all times. Now, I hear someone, I think Miss Susan, you're asking, what is a vision board, right baby? A vision board is a collage. It's a pictures of your hopes, your dreams, and your desires of what you want for your life. And once you put it in on a poster board so as, as this, you put it on the wall, wherever it is that you see it every single day. Now, the vision board is also a, it serves as inspiration, aspiration, motivation. But guess what I call the vision board? Prayer in print. Prayer in print. Because raise your hands if you ever had a, you did the New Year's resolution. Anybody? Okay, well guess what? Keep your hands up because it's June. How many of y'all have fulfilled the New Year's resolution? Right, because you had it focused. Now, for the rest of us that don't make the New Year's resolution, we're not failures or anything like that. Life happens. Life, love, divorce, death, birth, win some money, lose some money. Life happens. So it takes us off our focus of what we want for ourselves. You understand what I'm saying here is that this right here, put it where you can see it, where you want it. You want a new car? You want a new house? In 2008, the doctor said that I would never be able to walk. I did three bouts with being paralyzed until I had, I was walking with a cane and a walker. That's why most of you hadn't seen me. They said, I'm sorry, Ms. Hawthorne. Oh, baby, how you like me now? A vision board, thank you, of good health. I put it where I could see it. I didn't cry about this pain. Oh, no, good health. That's all I focus on was good health. 
My daughter, she came to me crying one day, mom, I just can't do this. My car is too much. Blah, 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 blah. I said, well, you know, I can't help you personally, but put it in a vision board. I'm not sure where hers is, but anyway, with her vision board, she got a brand new car. Now, wait, this is the thing so I can tell you. She got into an accident, but it was very minor, but it was major enough to total the car. So they gave her a brand new car with a lower car note, and the insurance gave her $10,000 that was on her vision board. So ask yourself, what, what would your vision board look like? How crazy and wild and off the chain would your vision board look like? And it's not difficult. It's not hard. Tonight while we were here, I got two volunteers and I'll show you quickly. They did a vision board in the back, right here. They're gonna take it home and put it on their wall and someone is gonna get $10,000 and a couple of hundred dollars and go on vacation. Someone right here, this person wanna eat healthy. <laughs> Yay for her, but she's want to eat healthy and walk and make a little money. The thing is that they did it right here. It was no magic abracadabra. But what it is is that you're going to take it home and place it on the, on the wall where you can see it. And don't let anyone discourage you and tell you you can't have it. So let me hear you scream, peace, love, and happiness. Come on. Don't you want prosperity, success, and money? Yeah, I don't think y'all do. Because you got to get that money. You got to get that energy. You have to be positive. There you go. Take some of that and put it in your glove compartment. Put it in your wallet. Put it wherever you can see it. Put it on your wall and watch <clears throat> the money come to you. It has always come to me. So it will come to you. Toastmaster. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure what he wants me to do. Good job. <laughs> Good job. Yeah. Mm. Well, you know I got it. He's trying to be funny. You know I got it. Yeah. <laughs> Rob Ducks. All right. Rob was fishing. He hooked one. <laughs> well, my vision board is on my refrigerator. A bunch of pictures of my granddaughter. Helps me wake up every morning with something positive to think about and want to do. Well, thank you very much. That's it was interesting. Really enjoyed the idea. And in fact, it, somebody reminded me. In fact, I reminded somebody else about the same thing that a lot of people have a vision, but that vision will never come into effect unless you envision yourself in that vision. So that's a lot. Of what she has with the vision board, you can see yourself in having that. So great words, great presentation. Do I need to bring this back down, Rob? And I'm assuming the screen is a button here. This one down. Black, yeah. That way we can see Tom again. Do we want to see Tom again? Yes. All right. I want to see Connie. I'm not sure about Tom. <laughs> Each to their own. <laughs> oh, one time only. Not a dead man switch, huh? I'm impressing. <laughs> Mood lighting. All righty. Well, there you go. Zini. We have two great presentations, an excellent QS speech tonight. I'm almost done until I get some final words from our illustrious leaders, but I'll share one last story with you. There's a gentleman driving down the freeway pretty fast, and sure enough, he gets pulled over by the high patrol. Woo. Police officer walks up to him and he says, Why are you going in such a hurry? He says, Well, you caught me. I just robbed the bank in town <laughs> and there's a bunch of money in the trunk, my guns. And that's just, that's what, that's the truth. So the officer says, Whoa, wait a minute. He calls the sergeant and says, Hey, you got to get down here. So the sergeant comes down. He tells the sergeant, this guy robbed a bank. He's got his weapons in the trunk along with all the money. And they go, oh, okay. So they pull him out of the car, march him over to the patrol car handcuffed. And they present, present, continue to search the vehicle. They opened the trunk and they found nothing. So the sergeant looks at his patrol officer and is kind of confused, goes back to the guy and says, hey, we went in your trunk, we didn't find anything. And he says that you had 
money and guns in your trunk. We found nothing. And the guy says, yeah, you know what? I bet you probably told you I was speeding too, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> With that, Tom, you may have the floor now. In closing comments before we wrap this up. Uh, well, I guess the one comment I would have would be, do we have anybody from the district to make any announcements? Uh, I don't see Jeremiah here. We have Toastmasters Leadership Institute June 15th. There you go. There you go. We have Postmasters Leadership Institute in June fifteenth over at, over at the Alexander Hughes Center. Uh, breakfast and lunch will be served, and the greatest keynote speaker in all of District Twelve, in my humble opinion, Dr. Charlotte Noggle, will be talking. Yes, about conflict negotiation. It's a hybrid meeting. Be there in person and on Zoom. Area director and division director training is June 22nd. More information to follow. Okay, well, the only other thing I can think about is that our next meeting normally is the first Wednesday of the month. And we will expect to meet on the 10th of July instead of the 3rd. So it doesn't interfere with the 4th. Here you are Did you get that? Did you get that? No. 10th of the month is going to be what? But wait, the, uh, I asked for some opinion, and the only opinions I got were to move the the uh, between the either the 3rd or the 10th, and it makes more sense to have the meeting on the 10th rather than the night before the 4th of July a holiday. So we will try to have the next Speakers Bureau meeting on the 10th, and yeah. I certainly want to thank David for stepping in both when both Michael and I were unavailable to run the meeting, thank you so much for doing that. And those speakers that stepped in, I really appreciate their being there. All right, thank you, Tom. Thank you very much for the opportunity to help present here at the District 12 Speaker Bureau. It's been my pleasure. I believe now the meeting is adjourned. <laughs>